do thank you and praise you and want much glory to come to you this morning and, well, all days, really. But, Father, we enjoy to gather together as your church to worship you, to exalt you, to lift high the name of Jesus, your Son, who paid it all, who paid it all for us. Lord, I pray that our worship has been acceptable to you already, pleasing to you, a sweet aroma to you. Lord, whether it's through our giving or through our fellowship or through our singing or through the scripture reading and and now, Lord, the preaching and teaching of your word, we pray, Lord, I pray for myself that you would help me just with the ability to preach your word with clarity and with conviction, with truth. And we pray, Lord, just to have listening ears and hearts and minds that are ready to take your word in and and to understand it and to apply it. Father, we pray these things now in your son Jesus' name. Amen. When, um, When we first brought our son Owen home from the hospital. He had been in the the NICU uh, for a number of weeks. Uh, We were fostering him, looking forward to adopting him. And we had only had him at home, I think, just for several weeks when uh, one evening I was just sitting there on the couch and he was just kind of resting uh, resting in my arms. Um, And I noticed that he suddenly started to feel heavy, just kind of like like just just weight and weight that wasn't moving or or active. And and I looked down and it was kind of kind of dim, the lighting and and but he didn't look good. And I called Julie over and she said, he's not breathing. And she grabs him and and just starts to to, uh, you know, pat him and, 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 and try to uh, um, touch him and flick his uh, feet and, and to get him to breathe and takes him into the, the bedroom with a better light and continues this. In the meantime, I'm on the phone to 911 and uh, sent some of the kids out to the end of our road so that the ambulance would be able to see, paramedics would be able to see right where we lived. And of course, you're starting to pray during this time. And uh, they came, the paramedics, Julie was incredible and, and got him breathing again. And the paramedics came and there wasn't really much they could do. They didn't even have a mask that was small enough for him. The mask they had was too big. And so um, at that point they said, we, we could take him or you could just take him down to the hospital. Thankfully we had a hospital in Weaverville. We get down there. He stopped breathing a couple of more times while we were there, but thankfully we're at the hospital now. And and so then they call for a helicopter to come because he has to be taken down to Sacramento. And again, more, more prayer, and, and the helicopter finally comes. And, and that was one of the strangest, surreal moments for myself, watching my wife and, and our son board this helicopter. And, and I'm just hoping and praying that he makes it to Sacramento and that he doesn't die in the process. More prayer. And, and, and thankfully, they get to the hospital, and he's in the NICU there for just a few days. I was able to, to, uh, to go down and, uh, and be with them, and, and thankfully, uh, things started to get better. And it turns out he had RSV, and, and that was what, what caused his breathing to stop. And through it all, I was thinking about this. Because you, you, you're praying, but you never, you never quite know what the outcome's going to be. You're hopeful that things are going to be okay, but, but you don't know. And, and, and I know all of you, all of you have had situations of, whether it's distress or affliction or difficulties or sufferings, or disease, or hospitalizations, or persecutions, 
And, and as believers, like I said, of course, we are praying through it and, 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 and hopefully trusting the Lord. But, but you never exactly know what the outcome is going to be of that given situation. And I know some of you have gone through way worse situations than what, than what we have. But praise Him, friends. Praise Him, though, that, that there is some certainty for us as believers. That, that even when you endure persecutions, afflictions, sufferings, difficulties, however you want to classify it or, or, or call it, that as a Christian, there is an ultimate hope, promise, to look forward to in life. We are told about trials and persecutions in Scripture, but we are also told about the outcome, the final outcome for all who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the outcome is glorious. It is incredible. It is amazing. It is something to absolutely look forward to and to be comforted by, to be strengthened by. And that's what we want to consider this morning. With that, please open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> Last week we kicked things off with this uh, 2 Thessalonians after having gone through 1 Thessalonians. And in so doing, last week, we used it as an opportunity to just remind ourselves of some of the background of the church there in Thessalonica, not the least of which is how, upon its formation, it almost immediately fell under persecution and affliction. First, it came from the Jews that were there, were very jealous of the Christian converts, and they rounded up then other wicked people. They formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar. And we also learned that even after Paul and Silvanus had left Thessalonica and arrived in Berea, Timothy, the Jews followed them there, even agitating the crowds, stirring up the crowds there as well. That made me think, of course, we have had our fair share even of seeing these kinds of things happen in the last couple of years here in our country where indeed people would get stirred up and sometimes even a mob forms and violence gets committed. That's what they were experiencing. Paul acknowledged some of this persecution and affliction in 1 Thessalonians commenting back in that letter that they received the word in much tribulation. They had endured sufferings at the hands of their own countrymen, and that Timothy was dispatched to strengthen and encourage them so that they would not be disturbed or deceived by these afflictions that had come upon them. Now, the second letter of, of, uh, that we're in here right now took place uh, maybe some six months or so after Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. And uh, as we said, we kind of did that introduction last week, and we looked at the first four verses, which told us that, that even amidst the persecutions and the sufferings and the trials and the afflictions, things were, were generally going well for the church itself. They were, in fact, commended for their faith, which had become greatly enlarged. And they were commended for their perseverance, and they were commended for the, the love that they had for one another that was, that was growing, and all of this in the midst of the persecutions and afflictions. This brings us then to verses 5 to 12, where we will see the theme of persecution and affliction continue, but now in the context of God's righteous judgment. So let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to read again 5 to 12, and we will spend the next three weeks with, with these verses. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. Where Paul writes, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. 
For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, friends, over the course of the next three weeks, as I just mentioned, you are going to see and learn about God's righteous judgment. And and we will do so in, in three respects. You will see God's righteous judgment in the sense of the hope to come, justice served, and a prayer for today. This morning, we are going to focus on the hope to come. And in so doing, I want you to see two promises Two promises that God makes to his believing children who suffer persecution and affliction so that your faith, your faith will endure and persevere. And the first promise is this. You are promised the kingdom of God. You are promised the kingdom of God. Look back at verse 5. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. Now, I'm hoping even with that first verse that that maybe already some questions might be starting to form in your minds. Let's start with this. What is God's righteous judgment? Now, we typically understand judgment to be in a negative sense. As in God's judgment of sin, God's judgment of sinners. In Joel, the book of Joel chapter 3 verses 12 to 14, the prophet tells us that God will judge the nations for their wickedness is great. This is also referred to as the day of the Lord as we learned in 1 Thessalonians. It's a time of judgment as well as a specific day when the Lord returns to deal out retribution as our passage tells us here in verse 8. In Romans 2 and verse 5 Paul writes, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's, That's that kind of judgment that should just make us quiver give us the the heebie-jeebies if you will and of course there is there is God's final judgment there's that great white throne judgment of Revelation 20 where those who have rejected Christ are judged according to their deeds and and anyone's name who is not found in the book of life the Lamb's book of life meaning a true believer then he is thrown into the lake of fire this is God's judgment However, God's judgment is not always to be understood in a negative sense. The word judgment just simply means to separate or divide. And it can mean a a decision, either positively or negatively. In Psalm 72, verses 1 and 2, uh, has Solomon praying for himself and his son, saying, Give the king your judgments, O God. And your righteousness to the king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and you're you're afflicted with justice. So we see their judgment being a good thing. um, A positive thing for God's people who are afflicted. In the case of our text in 2 Thessalonians, you will see that God's judgment will refer to decisions of God both positively and negatively. We'll get to those decisions in a moment. But next, let's ask this question, what does it mean God's righteous judgment? 
his righteous judgment. And this simply means that any decision that God makes, it is absolutely right. And it's based on his attributes. It's based on his characteristics which tell us that God is 100% right and altogether just. His righteous character means that all of his decisions and actions are indeed right. They are never wrong. They are never sinful. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments, says the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 137, or Psalm 9 and verse 8, which says that he has established his throne for judgment and he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. And in Psalm 19 and verse 9, we read the judgments of the Lord. We could say in parentheses, whatever those judgments are, all judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous all together. And Psalm 50 and verse 6 says, The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. He is a righteous, altogether right judge. Psalm, excuse me, First uh, Peter 2, 23, this is referring to Jesus. And while being reviled, to be reviled just means to be verbally abused. While being reviled, he, Jesus, did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Referring, of course, to God, his Father. So, what is then God's righteous judgment in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5? When we go back to verse 5, then the next part of the verse starts to give us a clue. When he says, so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. So, in other words, God is making a righteous judgment that somebody will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. And so how are we to understand the kingdom of God? also known as the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ. Well, to begin with, any kingdom must have three things, right? First of which, a kingdom must have a king. There you go, good. And then secondly, the king has to have subjects, right? Uh, people to rule over. And then thirdly, there has to be some kind of kingdom or a realm, right? A realm uh, that a king has jurisdiction over. So broadly defined, God's kingdom would be the rule of God over his creation. And especially, of course, people. Now, when we look in scripture, we see, we see two basic kinds of kingdoms. Two basic kinds of kingdoms. The first is what we might call God's universal kingdom. Also known as his sovereign kingdom or his invisible kingdom and the bible tells us a few things about this kind of kingdom uh, that one this kind of kingdom has always existed we see that in psalm 10 verse 16 this universal kingdom is universal in scope psalm 103 verse 19 it is ruled directly by god psalm 59 13 it is also a present reality psalm 29 10 and is an unconditional rule of God over his creatures. And we see that in Daniel 4, 34 and 35. Now, the second kind of kingdom found in the scripture is called a mediatorial kingdom, uh, also known as the millennial kingdom, the messianic kingdom, the visible kingdom. And, and this mediatorial kingdom has a definite historical beginning, we see that in Daniel 2.44. It also has a local rule established on earth, Isaiah 24.23. We see that God rules through a mediator, Psalm 2, verses 4 to 6. And it also has a future reality. It is a kingdom of the future, according to Zechariah 14.9. And then lastly, it is based on a covenant made by God with man. Psalm 89 verses 27 to 29. 
Now, in the context of our passage here in 2 Thessalonians, the kingdom being referred to is a mediatorial kingdom of God. It is ruled by who? His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do we know this? Well, well, first, because we know that Jesus is God's chosen king. We celebrated that back even on Palm Sunday, right, with his, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the acknowledgement of him being a king. And then in verse 7 of our passage, it also tells us that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, Matthew 25 and verse 31 would tell us about this same event. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And back in 2 Thessalonians, it says that Jesus will deal out retribution then to to those who have disobeyed his gospel, referring to unbelievers, verse 8, and he will be glorified by his subjects, all who have believed in him, verses 8 and 10. So then we can just simply ask, okay, so who is it then that, that sits on a throne? And who is it that deals out retribution? And who is glorified by his subjects? A king, the king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And while we understand Jesus to have been a, a king, certainly in some sense when he was alive and, and currently a king in heaven, we also want to understand from Scripture how we see in Scripture his kingdom being in two primary stages. Two primary stages. The first being his thousand years in which Christ will be ruling and reigning on earth, albeit on the old heavens and the old earth, Uh, which is to say the current heavens and the current earth, right? According to Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. This will then transition, transition into the eternal state after Christ has destroyed with fire the the old heavens and the old earth, and he has recreated them. Then this kingdom will be eternal. This kingdom will be everlasting. It will go on forever and ever and ever. In other words, the kingdom of God in our text will be ruled by King Jesus, his subjects will be us as believers, and his rule extends over all of his creation for all eternity. Now, getting back to Genesis, or excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5, we want to ask another question. Who is it that will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God? Well, the text tells us somebody who is suffering, somebody who is suffering. And who is it then that's suffering? And as Paul has already made clear in the first four verses, it is the church there at Thessalonica. So therefore, in in its proper context, it's the suffering believers that make up the local body of Thessalonica Bible Church that will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. And you go, oh, okay, yeah, I get that, but w- w- what about us? What about us here at Calvary Bible Church in 2022? Is this true for us as well? Hold that thought. We'll get to it in just a sec, okay? Now, if we were to move on from our passage at this point, then I would hope some of you would you know, kind of raise your hand and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, because it seems that you forgot a whole phrase there at the beginning of verse 5, Pastor Jay. I'm so glad you noticed. I didn't actually forget it. I was just saving it until now. Look at the beginning of verse 5. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment. Now, uh, in your Bibles, it might have this is in italics. And just to give you a quick refresher, when we see things in italics in most of our translations, it means that those words are not uh, actually in the Greek text, but they have been supplied by the translators of that translation to kind of help better with the understanding of the passage or the verse. And I would say most of the time, 
those are, are perfectly fine words to have included. If there's ever a time when, when I don't think it's right or appropriate, I will certainly tell you. But in the case of what we have here this morning, it would seem absolutely fine that those words, this is a plain indication, is all well and good. And this tells us then, or, or we should ask next, what then? What is a plain indication? A plain indication, by the way, just mean, meaning proof evidence. So, so what then is proof? What then is the evidences of God's righteous judgment? Well, that tells us the Thessalonians that they are worthy of the kingdom of God. And, and Paul did mention at the end of verse 5 the fact that they are suffering, right? But we would ask, suffering in what sense? Are, are you know, they suffering from hunger? or are they suffering from thirst, or the elements, or the fact that they don't have a church pickleball league yet, you know. Now, let's just stop for a sec here. You got to get used to it, okay? I'm sorry, I know. Uh, you know, up in Weaverville, they had fly fishing illustrations for 13 years, okay? So, so you guys can, can suffer through a few more pickleball illustrations. I'll try to keep them a little few and far between, all right? So just get that understood until I get on to something else, right? Now, to see specifically what is the proof or evidence that has to do with suffering, then we got to back up a little bit. we got to back up to verse 4, where Paul says in verse 4, Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God, here it is, friends, for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. So, the evidence or proof that has to do with suffering that the Thessalonians will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God is their perseverance and faith as they endure persecution and affliction. Now, we don't want to misunderstand something here. Paul is not saying that the persecution, affliction, and suffering is what gets them into the kingdom of God. Those things do not save the Thessalonians. They don't save anyone. But rather, they are the evidence, they are the proof of their salvation and that they would be worthy of the kingdom of God. Now, we talked last week about what that persecution and affliction and suffering was for the Thessalonians, and we just did a brief recap, you know, today, again, the jealousy of the Jews, and they were stirring up other people, and, and, and how they, they followed, you know, Paul and Silvanus to the next city, to Berea, and they're, they're kind of stirring things up there, and they're really making life miserable for them, and making things very difficult for them. And we'll just kind of, that's, our, that's the, the understanding that we have of what was going on there uh, with the church at Thessalonica in terms of their persecutions and afflictions. We aren't told that much more. But there's many more questions that I think we could ask even about what we have read so far here in verse 5. In other words, or for example, what exactly is this kingdom of God? And, and when does this kingdom of God come into play? Is it, is it happening now or is it in the future? Is it for anyone else other than the Thessalonians? Uh, is it just for those who suffer persecution and affliction? And if God's promise for, for uh, this, this kingdom of his is for others beyond the church at Thessalonica, does, does this mean that, that we too will suffer persecution and affliction, if so, what might we expect that to look like? Glad you asked. So let's, let's, uh, let's look at these last couple of questions first, and then we'll talk more about the kingdom in our next point. Go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy, just go a little bit to the right there. Not far. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 12, but we're actually going to get a little running start and, and begin in verse 10. Verse 12 is a, actually a pretty short verse, but I want you to see this clearly. I want you to see it with your own eyes there in, in black and white. Actually, yeah, let's back up to verse 10. We'll get a little running start here. Remember, Paul is writing to his protege, 
Timothy, and it's in the context of how difficult times will come in the last days. The last days being when? This current church age, which means from Jesus' first coming until his second coming. You go, are we in that church age? Yes, we are, right? So therefore, are we in the last days? We would say, yes, we are. Okay, difficult times will come. Let's look at verse 10. Uh, He writes this, Paul writes to Timothy, Now, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and suffering, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Now just pause there for a second, friends, and, and think. Along with Timothy, should we follow Paul's teaching? Yes, we should, right? Should we follow Paul's conduct? Yes, we should. Should we follow his purpose and faith and patience and love and perseverance? And we would say wholeheartedly, yes. What about his persecutions and sufferings? Do we have to? Look at verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Survey says, yes. Yes. As far as you are a believer, then You desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Therefore, friends, you will be persecuted. How do we see this persecution play out? And again, I know we talked a little bit last week about some of that. We we see it play out right now in a worldwide sense, right, in terms of the persecution of the church. And there are churches that are forced to be underground. There are people that are ostracized by family, by friends for their faith in other countries. They are jailed. They are even killed currently. When we get back to more our neck of the woods, and let's just say North America, so we'll include, you know, say Canada in that as well. Of course, we saw aspects of persecution, I would say, during even the times of COVID. Uh, I've mentioned to you before the Canadian pastor, James Coates, and some of the persecution that they endured up there at his church in Canada, him even being jailed uh, for their their beliefs. Um, We see currently social institutions in our country that are not favorable towards Christians by any stretch of the imagination, including academia and the media and in political realms and arts and entertainment. And it would seem, too, that we are, we are past the point of some kind of a mild disgust, you know, that, that people out there in the world might have for believers, and it's coming out as full-on hatred, which also leads to discrimination and, and consequences of persecution to different degrees. I think we will only expect to see this worsen as the years go on. And I know some of you out there have tangibly experienced some of these things. Bruce Windler was telling uh, us in our Crossroads class just this crazy story of, of handing out Bibles to the Gideons and doing, le- doing it legally, you know, on, on the sidewalk kind of thing and just offering and, and just parents that were screaming and, and trying to get themselves between the Gideons and the students to prevent the Word of God from getting into the students' hands and just, just where it, it gets borderline on, 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 on being violent even. And friends, we could do... We can do many sermons on suffering alone. And undoubtedly, if we did, that we would find ourselves spending much time in 1 Peter. Go ahead and turn there for a moment. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We, we understand persecutions from our text, and we also understand afflictions. Well, actually, we're going to talk more about both those in, in, in uh in a second, especially in the affliction realm. But 1 Peter 2, 21. In 1 Peter, uh, Peter has as, as one of his major themes the suffering 
of believers. The suffering of believers. Because that's who the book was being written to. And right off the bat in chapter 1, you know, if we were to go through the whole book, you would, you would see and learn how being distressed by various trials in your life will be evidence of your faith, your precious faith. And it will actually bring praise, glory, and honor to you from God at the return of his son. We see that in chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. You would also see how being submissive to those in authority over you who are unreasonable, that literally means perverse, also harsh or abusive, and how if you bear up under sorrows when suffering unjustly, and you suffer for doing what is right, patiently enduring, guess what? This finds favor with God. It finds favor with God. We see that in verses 18 to 20. And you might be thinking already, yeah, okay, okay, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, but I just, I don't know if I have that in me. I, I, I just don't know if I have it in me to do those kinds of things. Here's the short answer to that. Yes, you do. You absolutely do. Because, friends, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit now living and dwelling and abiding in you. And with that, too, you have Christ, the Lord Jesus, as your awesome example. So now we get to 1 Peter 2, 21, and we see this example where Peter writes, For you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That is for us, friends, that we have been called for this purpose even for suffering and that we are to follow in Christ's footsteps his example we are to of course entrust ourselves to the father through this time and consider the attitude of Peter and the apostles going back a few years after they had been jailed in the book of Acts they had been released and then they were flogged 39 lashes For preaching the gospel of Christ. In Acts 5 and verse 41 it says. So they went on their way. From the presence of the council. That is after all of those things happening to them. Rejoicing. That's what it says. Rejoicing. That they had been considered worthy. To suffer shame. For his name. I know that's an incredible statement. An incredible understanding. For us. But here's the fact of the matter, friends, that if God has said that as Christians we are to suffer for our faith, and if he has said that we are to follow the example set forth by his Son, then guess what? He will undoubtedly give you the power to be able to do so. He gives you that power again through the Holy Spirit living inside of you, through His Word. He will certainly give you the grace. He will certainly give you the strength that you will need to persevere and endure. And and friends, if you think, what's the worst that could happen? Well, I could die. Yes, you can, and you get to glory that much quicker. Well, this all leads well into the second promise. Because with the promise of the kingdom of God, secondly, you are also promised the relief of God. The relief of God. Look back at our text. Get back to 2 Thessalonians there in in chapter 1, verse 7. And to give relief to you who are afflicted, And to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Just pause there for a couple of minutes. This reference to mighty angels in flaming fire is certainly reference to God's retributive 
judgment, which we will cover next week. So you'll see we'll be skipping over uh, some of these verses because they're about his retributive judgment. Get to that next week. But this, um, just right off the bat, something interesting I, I want you to see here about this relief. When you go back to verse 6, you see that we read this, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and, and to give relief to those who are afflicted. This is, this is incredible because in other words, this giving of relief is actually just for God to do. Just let that sink in for a minute. It is just for him to give relief, which, which also means that God couldn't not do it. He couldn't not give relief. He would be incapable of not serving justice by being re- bringing relief to his afflicted. And, and in this, we have to remember that justice is twofold, or it can be viewed in, in say, two different ways. For instance, it is just for a criminal to have consequences for a crime that they committed. But it's also just for someone who maybe had that crime committed against them to have consequences come to their perpetrator. So, in other words, just for sake of an illustration, if, if, if parents are, are in a courtroom for a crime of somebody else hurting their child, and the person confessed to the crime, uh, the evidence uh, or proof is, is absolutely overwhelming and, and positive that they committed the crime, then justice is served towards that criminal when they are sentenced and they are given a consequence. But at the same time, justice is also served towards the family when that happens. In other words, justice comes to the one perpetrating the crime, but then justice also comes to whom the crime has been perpetrated against. Now, God's justice is one of those attributes that he passes on to us as those made in his image. And that's why every human being created has a sense of justice inside of them. Now, we might not agree where that bar of justice kind of might you know, be for, for some people, but the fact is, it's in there somewhere. And the thing, the thing is, is we often get frustrated because we think justice is not being served sometimes in this life, or, or it's the fact that we don't always get to see justice served, and that, that gets kind of frustrating to us. But rest assured, friends, that justice will be meted out fully and completely and comprehensively, both positively and negatively, for those who have disobeyed the gospel of Christ and for those who have believed in it, justice will be served. Now that being said, let's continue in the the positive line of justice, God's justice being served. Part of the blessing of the kingdom of God at Jesus' glorious return is that God promises relief. Relief to the afflicted. Afflicted literally means to to press or to to squeeze or even to crush. And here it refers to the persecution taking place against the Thessalonians. But as we have learned, all believers, all believers will undergo some kind of persecution, some kind of affliction. We will all go through pressing and and squeezing and, and crushing in this life. Now this word relief, It literally means to loosen and should be understood here as in loosening from that that crushing or that squeezing and that pressing, loosing the bonds of affliction. It also means rest, and that would, would also be well understood here in this context. So then we might ask the question, so when? When will this relief come? When will this rest come? Look at verse 10. Verse 10. When he, Jesus, comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. In other words, it'll happen at his return. 
It'll happen at his second coming. Now, continuing with the theme of relief, when this happens... We're told here that Jesus will be glorified. He'll be glorified in his saints. And he will be marveled at. You see that previously believers, we've all been called to glorify God, haven't we? We see that back in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We see that in Colossians 3.17. We know that we're all to bring praise and glory to Christ. We see that in Philippians 1.11. But but. This could only be done imperfectly by us, this side of Jesus' return. Because we will always have our sin to contend with. So it will never be something we can do perfectly, glorifying Him. But as Philippians 3, 21 tells us, we wait for the return of Christ who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory, by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. And friends, this this is when he will be fully glorified in his saints, as we just read in verse 10. And this is when he will be marveled at among all who believed. And this is, this is Romans 8, verses 18 and 19, when Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. As Jesus reveals that glory to us. Verse 19, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And, and so in summary, this... This means that the afflictions, friends, at that point are long gone. They will be a thing of the past. Persecutions, history, and relief and rest have come fully, comprehensively, completely to those who are in Christ. To those who are in Christ as he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day. Now, this, this passage that we're in and, and what we will consider over the next couple of weeks, and then as we move into chapter 2, I think it just begs for a, a little review of God's eschatological or end times timeline that we presented back with 1 Thessalonians. Um, just to kind of keep things in mind in the right order. Do we, have, do we have a slide for that? There we go. So this was a slide that, that we had put together um, for 1 Thessalonians. Now, I just would say this in, in showing this to you again. We recognize that there are good and godly people who may differ, who will differ on some aspects of this end times timeline. And that's okay doesn't mean we're not brothers and sisters in Christ. We absolutely are. But this is where uh, currently we are at in Calvary Bible Church and, um, and what we believe to be true. So, so in this timeline, I just wanted to point out a few things. So there you see the cross. I'm trying to, there, I can read it there. So that is, that's the church age, right? Jesus dies on the cross. He resurrects. He ascends back up into heaven. We are in the church age. We also learn that, yes, the last times, until when? Until he returns, until he returns. We'll say that. He returns first to the clouds, right? And that's when we talked about the rapture back in 1 Thessalonians. He raptures his church, harpazo. He he harpoons his church, right? Those living, those dead in Christ and brings them to himself in the clouds, glorifying them, giving them even glorified bodies. He removes them from the wrath to come over the next seven years, that time of tribulation here on the earth. God pours out his wrath upon the earth. Then, seven years later, we have, of course, his, his return, where now he doesn't just come to the clouds, he comes back to the earth. He comes back to the earth. He wages war against his enemies. The, the beast, the false prophet, are tossed into the lake of fire. Satan is bound, and he is put into the pit for the next thousand years. That's what we call the millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign of Christ. At the end of that thousand-year reign of Christ, and Satan is released for a time, 
right? He tries to again deceive the nations until he is just completely crushed and also thrown into the lake of fire. We have the great white throne judgment of Jesus where all are judged and if anyone's name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, then he too, along with all of, of, of hell, are thrown into the lake of fire. This then brings about um, God's restoration, the new heavens, the new earth, the older are consumed by fire, and he recreates them. And that ushers in then the eternal state for all who have believed. And we get to live with Christ forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. What a Savior. What a Savior indeed. Now, something else I, I, I want to point out to you. Is, is that in the realm of relief, and we'll just leave that up for, till the end. You can just kind of see and refer to it. We're offered several kinds of relief, you might say, in the Scripture. First, there's the relief that comes at salvation. At salvation, when the burden and weight of your sin is lifted from your shoulders. Amen? Is that not a moment of relief? Listen to how John Bunyan John Bunyan, in his allegory, A Pilgrim's Progress, describes his main character, Christian, being relieved of his burden of sin from his back. In chapter 9, Bunyan writes this, Now, I saw in my dream that the highway along which Christian was to proceed was fenced in on both sides with a wall. And that wall was called Salvation. Therefore, burdened Christian ran up this way, though not without great difficulty, because of the load on his back. So he ran in this direction until he came to a place where the way ascended up a small hill, and at the top stood a cross, while below it was a stone tomb. And so I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up to the cross, his burden fell from his back. Then it continued to tumble down the hill until it fell into the mouth of the stone tomb and was seen no more. At this, Christian felt glad and overjoyed. And in his excitement, he exclaimed, He has given me rest by means of his sorrow and life by means of his death. Of course, referring to the Lord Jesus. And then he stood still for a while to look with wonder and amazement, for it was so surprising to him that the sight of the cross should accomplish the release of his burden. Therefore he looked again and again, even until inward springs of water flowed down his cheeks. Now as he stood looking and weeping, behold, three shining ones, angels, approached and saluted him with the benediction, let peace be upon you. So the first shining one said to him, your sins have been forgiven. End quote. That burden was released, his sins forgiven because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on the cross for you, friends, for me. Because of his death and, of course, his resurrection Oh, we know then that our sin is done away with. In fact, Christ has taken our sin upon himself and he has given to us in its place his righteousness. That burden has been, has been relieved. It has been lifted and taken off our backs. And if you, friends, would put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on that cross you too will have forgiveness of sins. And thankfully it doesn't end there because then three days later, he, he, from being in the tomb, from being in the grave, three days later, of course, he resurrects. And, and, that, and that absolutely tells us for certain that our sins have been forgiven and not just that our sins are forgiven, but the point of that is then that we can have eternal life as Christ has eternal life and that we can, we can live with Christ for all eternity in his heavenly kingdom because those sins have been forgiven Relief has come for our sins. Friends, let us, let us take heed of what Jesus said in Matthew 12, 28 to 30. 
Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you relief. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Come to forgive wayward sinners like us and provide relief. We see this gospel relief also from our verse 10 in our text when Paul refers to Jesus' saints as those who have believed, which includes the Thessalonians, for our testimony to you was believed. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy delivered the gospel to them along with their gospel-impacted lives as a testimony of the good news of Jesus and how he not only forgives sins but changes, changes people from the inside out, giving us new hearts and new desires to bring glory to him as the king and to our father. So yes, friends, salvation brings relief. It brings relief from sin and its ultimate consequences of death and hell and the lake of fire. There's also another kind of relief that occurs when Christ returns to the clouds and he raptures his church when both the dead and living believers in Christ are raised to new life and given those glorified bodies and they live with Christ in heaven, granting them relief from from the tribulation time of those Seven years. And then there is another time of relief following close on on the heels of that that comes after Christ's bodily return to earth when he sets up his millennial kingdom. As Peter preaches in Acts 3, verses 19 to 21, and when he says, Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come. From the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. And then after that thousand year reign of Christ again comes that great white throne judgment when we are left only then after that with those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, believers. And this brings about that final rest, that final relief known as the eternal state because it lasts for eternity. And we know that we are given then final relief from all of our persecutions, from all of our afflictions, because as John tells us in Revelation 21, verses 3 to 4, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. That should just knock our socks off, right? God will be among us, verse 4, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's true relief, friends. And he will, there will no longer be any death. That is true relief. And there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Everlasting relief has come everlasting rest. Amen. And again, hallelujah, what a Savior. Now, now, now friends, what, so, what, so what do we do with this? What do we do with these amazing truths that we have learned this morning? What do we, what do we learn from these, these two promises, the, the, this, this promise of the kingdom of God and, and this, this promise of relief and, and even rest? Here, here's what I would have you do for just a moment. Just imagine, remember, remember back to when you were not a believer. And, and maybe there was a time of trial or a time of difficulty or a time of even persecution. Maybe it wasn't for being a, you know, a, a Christian, obviously, but for something else or, or a time of affliction as an unbeliever. When 
yeah, you don't know the outcome of whatever trial or difficulty you are in. You don't know what the outcome is going to be. You kind of hope for the best, but, but you're, you're not really sure what's going to happen. And that's the best you have. W- what did it feel like to you to not know about anything else in the future? Or, or an eternal destiny? Maybe you were like me and you just despaired. Despair sets in. And you kind of go at that point, well, I hope there's an afterlife and I hope there's something else. And because man, if I just got to keep suffering through this this stuff here on this earth, man, this is this is gonna be it's gonna be weighty and painful and just but praise God, friends, that we do have these promises. No, we're, we're not going to know in any any time of trial or difficulty or affliction or persecution what the what the end is of, of that specific time in our life is going to be. And yes, we hope and pray for something favorable from the Lord, but maybe it will be that way, maybe it won't. But just a little beyond that, just beyond that, we always see the hope of the kingdom of God. We always, always have the hope of relief and rest that we are promised in our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can't ever forget that. We can't ever lose that. We have to always have that view in mind. We have to always, friends, have and keep and and hold on to that eternal perspective so that we see beyond the difficulty, affliction, suffering, trial, persecution, whatever, to the kingdom of God, the relief and rest that we are promised with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will get you through that time of difficulty. And it will get you through it in a way that will bring glory to Him, that will bring glory to Christ, that will bring glory to the Father. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank You, Lord, for just this text and what You have shown us from Your Word this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we always have the kingdom of God, that rock-solid promise to look forward to. And in the realm of that kingdom of God, we find rest. And we find relief from all that has afflicted us in this life. Lord, I pray for any that need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior this morning, that they would even pray a prayer of, of repentance to you and of faith in what he accomplished on the cross on their behalf. And we pray all of these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.